Yeah, yeah. Everyone <laughs> goes through this moment of, well, if I just need to get better at gymnastics, monostructural and lifting, and then, you know, every once in a while, they ask me to put it back together. It just doesn't work. But what's amazing is these ideas are not mutually exclusive. You can do what you asked and what we are asking at the exact same time. You need to have just as many eggs in the basket of low skill Metcons, traditional couplets, triplets, CrossFit, and monostructural work, skill work, and strength work. That's what a CrossFit program is. That is what our program is. Um, so you do need to take those things out and you do need to do them on their own, but not sacrificing CrossFit because the adaptation and the stimulus and the things that you learn are just too damn important. Roland. Good morning, Misfits. You are tuning into another episode of the Misfit Podcast. The boys are back in town. They didn't even know we were on. Full goon squad. And just to be clear, I was gone for two weeks, and that was a while ago. It's like a month ago. (laughs) We recorded some backlog because Ted's vacation was on the back end of mine. And it really, there was a vibe going around that I had been, you know, running around fucking Italy for two months, which I wish I was. (laughs) Damn, give me on that plan. has been on vacation for three months. He hasn't done a minute of work. I believe the (laughs) quote delivered to me was, Hunter said I was bumble fucking my way around Europe or something like (laughs) that. That is accurate. That is what he said. That's perfect. That doesn't sound like something we would say. (laughs) Um, There's a lot going on. A lot sure going on in Misfit World right now. Um, CrossFit World, Misfit World. So there's a brand spanking new MisfitAthletics.com. And if you are a longtime podcast listener, you know that we talk a lot about the value of having a week of programming in advance and having weakness templates and taking the variable training system and really making it work for you. The feedback that we got from people that have a subscription at misfitathletics.com was that the complete tier was too expensive. Um, We'd love to do this. You guys provide this advice. You make it seem like the best way to train, and then you've left it a little bit out of reach. Um, That is no longer. You get every single thing that we offer, everyone does, at misfitathletics.com for $39.95 versus $69.95 is is what it was before. So um, really big change there, something that we're really excited about. Um, We feel like there's a, it's not quite practice what you preach, but it's just, you know, really connecting the message with what we're delivering for a product. Um, And I think we're going to feel a lot better about talking about the nuance of week in advance and weakness templates and all that, because all of our customers get that now. I think, I mean, I think it's a practice what you preach thing. It's like we suggest like hey picking and choosing moving pieces around based on your lifestyle your goals you know knowing that if i do chest to bar pull-ups for skill work today i'm not going to get lambasted with 100 tomorrow in the metcon that i can't see because i'm on one tier so um while obviously there's going to be varying opinions on it like it's now now every misfit follower has the ability to take the information that we are we provide that was maybe previously limited to folks willing to pay $70 a month for that week in advance. And now it's like, Hey, it's all out there. And now the onus is back to the athlete where we want it to be as far as like personalizing your training, taking all the resources that we have and applying the information that we, we try to provide as, as frequently as possible. So yeah, conversations I've had with people who use the website who do the complete tiers like <clears throat> some days I can only use a skier like some weeks only on a Tuesday it's the only day I can get to a gym that has this yeah. and like being able to shift things around or looking at the entire week and being like you know what I know coming off like Sunday rest day I've watched football all Sunday and now I want to get, like, get after it but I want to do it when I'm freshest I want to put the things at the highest priority at the front half of my week when I had the least amount of stress right and as it builds throughout the week I'm now able to organize in a fashion that allows me to pour the highest intensity early on the same way we talk about like splitting up sessions the same thing can be addressed when it comes to like a I guess mezzo view of your your phase yeah. looking at that and be like all right like I need to front load my week with these few pieces because I know I'm going to be freshest and be able to give them the most and then later on in the week I can maybe backfill with things that either are low priority or would be nice to get done but aren't essential pieces that and maybe would normally fall on like a Friday or a Saturday where you just feel like you're already beat up from the whole week of training the other upside that 
maybe you were getting to, but that's that's all programs as well. Yes. So previously it was just, right. you know, or I guess complete gave you access to every program, but you get every program now the full week in advance as well, which yeah, is Yeah, and important. I think I think it's it's good that this is the beginning of a Q&A podcast episode because we get to answer questions sort of in a different way. And then, you know, if we're all about personalizing your programming, um, it should be, it needs to be top to bottom because whatever your goals are, they're your goals and they're what you are trying to achieve. Right. And I know for me personally, like, like, you know, I basically do my own programming, but I, I got to know, I got to know what's going on here so I can sort of connect the dots on the things that Sherb was referencing. And then also there's something to, um, you know, it's the little bits of, it's like the old football player in me, but like circling that, you know, one opponent that you get, you know, now that you have your week mm, in advance, yeah. you get to go and say, well, that's actually taking my medicine. Like I know we say send pieces are, but for me, fucking, that's no medicine for me. I love it. It's yeah. great. It's a nice my, 20 minute cardio piece. That's his medicine. Yeah. My medicine is those build pieces. So when I see like, like actually today I got four one K rows and it's like, that's a, that's the opponent that got circled this week. Yep. It's like, that's the thing that's actually going to move the needle for me. So misfitathletics.com, everyone gets everything. Thirty nine ninety five. Um, we're really excited about it. Can't wait to hear you guys' feedback on what you think of the new site in Discord. Discord.gg forward slash Misfit Athletics to join the community. Completely free. Get in there. Um, definitely the most active that it's ever been. It's growing and growing across every, across all of week. our programs. Um, and also where m most of these questions came exactly. from. Exactly. So if you're yep. a listener. Make we sure we just try there. to prioritize answering questions for people who are part participating the most. So that's where we'll go first. Um, we also have our Misfit Athletics off-season training camp coming up December 9th through the 11th. You can head to misfit.camp to get signed up for that. Um, this camp is the most in-depth sort of peek behind the curtain version of camp that we're going to do. Um and it's one that's only going to happen once a year and it's going to happen in this you know sort of november december time frame moving forward um and it's really just sort of you know you're still going to get the community experience and you're still going to get you know the sort of thing that you would get at quarterfinals prep camp in terms of you know you got your lectures and you've got your you know movement breakouts and all of that but we're really trying to lean into um the, the, the athletes that want to know exactly like when I arrive in August and I have that gap from August to February, like what should I be doing? How do I actually improve like tangibly? How do I improve my athlete IQ? And then on the other side, I know that we have a ton of passionate coaches that are like coach athlete and on the team misfit side and would really like to know to be able to ask the questions in the q and a's and to work with us in a more hands-on environment i would say this is the most coach friendly offering that we currently have um so misfit.camp december 9th through the 11th off-season training camp we are going all the way in super in-depth for three days and then for the rest of you that are wondering about the 2023 camp schedule, um, just a just a teaser that the uh, quarterfinals prep camp that takes place sort of end of the open before quarterfinals is still the plan and is still in the works. Um, and that would be that final weekend of the open. So if you're trying to, to sort of circle something on your calendar, don't book any flights or anything like that. We got to make sure everything's 100% buttoned up on our end. But I know some people are asking about that, and that would be the next closest one. And last but not least, uh, we have a gear drop. Um, doesn't matter if you are a Misfit follower or just an STA fan. If you had to sharpen the axe use code page or Carol or Austin or your favorite misfit athlete. Um, we have lightweight hoodies. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm wearing one right now and our runners, um, sort of a lightweight, stretchy jogger, this sort of stuff, um, for someone that's already in the thick of it up in the Northeast, you're sort of lightweight, but not like, you know, still get some coverage. The wind doesn't, you know, tear through your soul or anything like that. Um, so lightweight hoodies, both on the STA misfit side, lightweight runners, joggers on the Misfit and STA side as well. You guys ready to get into it? Let's, Let's do it. Do it. <clears throat> um, I am going to start uh, by... 
a DM going into a DM. <laughs> so basically I've been going back and forth. Didn't forget it with didn't. <laughs> literally the top thing on the sheet. I'm Douglas, <laughs> Douglas Acosta, Acosta. Um, we have been going back and forth about a question and I figured instead of, um, getting thumb carpal tunnel that we could sort of work through this situation as a group on the Q and a podcast, just because of sort of the timing of it. Um, essentially, I don't know if you go by Doug or Douglas. I'm going to call you Doug. Sorry. Dougie. Um, yes, Dougie. <laughs> um, essentially Doug did a competition recently and uh, moderate to good lifter have virtually all of the skilled movements down. Um, but to be honest, my stamina while better than it used to be is still trash. Um, we started digging into it because the, the question part of it was that he had a workout with an echo bike. I believe it was an echo bike buy-in and Lovely. then felt not so amazing afterwards. What? Then we started going through, I asked them, okay, so there's the idea of pacing matters a lot. Pacing Never matters. Athlete IQ <laughs> matters just as much as your energy systems really sort of being in line. So we worked through that. He told me his energy system that he was lacking was power output. And then I believe he asked for a second in opinion and his wife said, no, 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 no. It's, it's like my weakness. It's that five to 15 minute range. It's the, you know, sort of anaerobic, the build, the, the, the meat and potatoes, your 500 meter rows and all yeah. that good stuff. Um, so the question is essentially, what do you do in that scenario when you're dealing with that? And I do need, I do need to make sure that people understand that an echo bike and an assault bike has readings on it that can be translated to any other machine, which means it's your fault if you don't know how to pace that machine. Everyone thinks you have to send on that thing. And we can agree that if you go slow, it doesn't really count, especially an assault bike. Yeah. It doesn't really count for you very much. But there aren't that many scenarios where they put this massive chunk what was the buy-in and how long was the workout roughly? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's so where I was going to go with this conversation yeah, so, next. So I don't, I don't want to get wrapped around that. Yep. We're going to give some advice on that five to 15 minute window more than yep. anything. But I just have to say, you need to know your, you know, two minutes and three minutes and four minute and one minute windows in terms of wattage or RPMs. You need to know that every once in a while we do program this just for the athlete IQ reason. If you are really that bad where whereas you're always gassed from it because you sprint it's like you, you wouldn't sprint if it was a row then when you go in and you see a similar time domain to this where you could get some good info just swap the bike in for the row the ski whatever if you have a question on how long to go just jump into discord that question will get answered super quick Pretty by quick, one yeah. of us or whatever but that's a sort of a side tangent of you need to know just like you know I hold a 140 in this scenario, 145 in this scenario, and a two minute in this scenario on Concept 2 machines. You need to know what you hold on an echo bike and an air bike. If you're always sprinting and dying or going too slow for anything to count, you don't know how to use that machine. So I'm just going to leave that off to the side so we don't spend too much time on that's like an ultra specific thing. This other window, um, obviously just identifying that this is the window and seeing what workouts are in there and getting better at them both from a pacing standpoint and then building capacity and then making sure you're doing your math i think those two things mixed together the time domain that you're struggling in and the mathetone work because we need to sort of mix the idea of more stamina and better power output with an actual like aerobic functioning those things have to come together for you to be able to deal with that. And I feel like that's honestly going to be an answer to half the questions in this podcast. Yeah, I mean, I think about it from the perspective of you ask someone to do, let's say we're trying to improve the 3K row, like a 11, 12 minute row for somebody, but we decided to break it up into six 500s. The best, the best adaptation in that piece would be the best overall average pace across all of your 500s as opposed to having one really kick-ass 500 at the front and then some really terribly slow ones at the end. So what you were just saying, I think is really important here is that we give workouts durations in terms of short, medium, long. Like if you look at the pacing instructions, you'll kind of see yeah. what the idea behind those things. But you have to know within each one of those short, medium, and long, there are many different gears and learning how to 
to read a workout and understanding which gear applies to what workout, which brings me to something I did yesterday, which had a 30 cal echo bike buy-in, some bar muscle up, some lunging and then back through it. And historically I'd probably be in the same circumstance where I would probably start the first 30 calories because they're not hard because it's the f you're fresh and you're starting the workout, go a little bit too fast and then stand at the pull-up bar. Then you knock off some big, big bar muscle upsets. You go to the barbell, the lunge, and all of a sudden you're staring at the barbell because you incorrectly pace the bike. Now it feels like you've gone away from that bike for so long, but what you did there is carrying over into everything else. So what you need to do is basically start, take time to look at a workout and be able to read into how long something should take and realize that you gaining five seconds in the first minute of the workout is going to put you behind the eight ball later on. So what you said, it perfectly applies for other machines. You very well versed in like 500 meter splits or cows per hour. You need to have the exact same thing with the echo bike and realize that you can't go slow, but you can't go too fast. And learning what that number that attaches to durations is super important there. So, you know, if you've never done this before and you know, maybe you do need to have a separate session where you literally bike one minute for a high output for an average output that feels sustainable for the entire minute, take five minutes off, then go maybe two minutes, take some time off, go four minutes. And I don't think you need to do it for every minute from one all the way to 60, but get versed in the common applications of our sport. You know, typically you're going to be on there from 40 seconds upwards of five minutes. You want to know what all those gears feel like so that when you know, when you get to a piece like that, what that pace looks like, because again, you can very quickly pace yourself out of a piece like this. And now you're leaving seconds on the table. It's akin to running a mile run and starting it with a PR 100 meter sprint doesn't do you any benefit. So learning that you'll be faster overall, even though it feels kind of easy at the beginning is going to be a more effective strategy than sprinting and resting, sprinting and resting because we've seen the best athletes in our sport be able to can hold a consistent pace the entire time. That's because they know exactly how long something's going to take, you know, within 30 seconds or so. And that helps them pick their pace going into it. Um, yeah, I think the, I'll keep mine short so we can keep plugging along here, but the Mathetone stuff and by the sounds of it, you're the type of athlete who maybe more often than not is the person who's like, I'm going to come out hot and try to hold on. And it sounds like you could probably use a lot of the the bitch work especially in that like you know too long to to seriously send like hammer as hard as you can like that i guess that probably you know three to ten minute range like you were saying five to fifteen whatever it is and and focusing on a sustainable pace throughout those training pieces you have to you have to teach your body that you can hold on to a specific pace rather than just hoping that you can hold on if you hammer hammer the first part of the workout and think you're going to survive un until the finish but doing and doing that is thinking about kind of like sherb said how long is the total duration of effort oh it's four minutes what do you mean i can't sprint the first 30 cals on the echo bike like if you do that yeah, everybody's stamina is going to feel bad. So like <laughs> we need to, it's a, it's a combination of pacing, uh, like learning to pace and then assuming that you're a set, the assessment is correct, that maybe you're a powerful athlete and you don't have that middle kind of gear, then it, it becomes a, a training kind of energy system type thing. Like when I do a piece that involves something like this and I'm trying to collect, I'm going to cut you off. All right, go ahead. You so we, read the next question. Right, Hunter. Right. We all can't right, do right. 10 minutes right, per Hunter. question. Right, it's 10 minutes question from <laughs> Shane underscore one, nine, eight, five. I'm in the top 1% for strength in my division, but about 10% on speed reps slash reps. I rely on my strength numbers to pull me up the leaderboards. I'm five foot 10, 210 pounds. So not a ninja when it comes to body weight, but I don't feel like I'm slow. Just not as fast as 180 pound athletes. How do I get faster? And do I sacrifice strength training for intervals or burpee EMOMs? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next. <laughs> uh, I, I'd, be, I'd be curious to know what the where those calculations come from as far as the top 1% of strength and the top 10%. I also don't exactly know what speed slash rep. Honestly, just think mean. he's talking I, about times and Metcons. Conditioning, times yeah. and Metcons. Um, the good news is, is that the solution is fairly simple. You got to put a lot more eggs in your conditioning basket. Um, I guess that's fine. That's the, 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 maybe the downside is that that 10%, that the conditioning, that's 98% of the sport. So we need to allocate 
the correct eggs into the correct basket, which means, yeah, maybe, maybe you're our, you get the one lift in the one mandatory lift in for the day, or maybe it's more technique work. But if you see one, two, three conditioning pieces, bitch work pieces, if there's a, you know, if you're trying to focus on rep speed, then there's plenty of skill, skill work that we have that actually emphasizes like rep speed or can be easily adapted to meet that kind of, uh, that, that fix that you're looking for. Uh, but yeah, being, being the top 1% of strength is terrific. That's great. Maintain that odds are if you drop off a little bit in that strength at the, uh, in order to purchase more conditioning power, uh, you're going to move way farther up the leaderboard than just being like, well, I'm going to keep that strength up. That's yeah. That's my, my two small port questions support. to answer a question would be, do you need to weigh I was thinking this 210 thing. pounds. Yep, that too. So that's definitely a question. Um, and then the other thing would be, you know, you might need a perspective shift on the whole like rep speed thing and figure out like really narrow down um, how good are you in terms of athlete IQ and pacing and then how good are each of your energy systems. I'm guessing they're probably similar to mine. Um based on the note there, but like good power output, not quite as good on the middle range and pretty slow on the, on the low end. So, um, perspective shift, I think would be really important, like really, truly identify like the next time we do this podcast, Shane, I hope you ask the same question, but with a finer sort of scope. And then we can, you've already sort of started to answer your own question and then we can help you narrow it down even further. Rachel one two two eight asks when to break pieces into different sessions. Um, she's got two questions, so we'll start there. Cool. Uh, so, I mean, the answer is tough without more context. I know Rachel posts mostly in the MFT. Um, if you're going to follow MFT you should not be doing it in one session. Um, you know, that's for someone who's trying to qualify for the semifinals and, uh, CrossFit games. So you just, you know, the, the issue here is what is a session, you know, is, is there are some people who show up at the gym at 10 AM and don't leave till 4 PM. Is that one session? Probably not. There's a potentially a meal in there, but does it count as a session? If you're, you know, laying on horse stall mats, eating rice, like that sort of thing. So, um, it's like a good time. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that certain pieces, depending on your strengths and weaknesses go together or don't. And when you truly divide it into separate <laughs> sessions, then you can narrow your, fo narrow, narrow your focus and not be one of those people that stares at the totality of this crazy whiteboard that you've created and just narrows down into that. So, um, as a, as someone who's trying to qualify for the semifinals, you absolutely like no question need to have multiple sessions in a day. Um, if we, if we wanted to go down to the hatchet level, I would just say, um, if you have the opportunity to do two sessions, just so you can separate things, you know, you before your before work and after work, just be mindful of, of, you know, it's, it's basically just guess and check. It's, I lift better at this time of day. I do bitch work better at this time of day and slash, or when I do these two things together, when I, when I do my bitch work and then I go to do my skill, I can't do the damn movement, whatever it is. So a little bit of guess and check there, but two sessions is ideal for just about everybody. Yeah. The way I like to think about it is just focus. How long can you stay focused for a session? As soon as you feel like you're losing focus and you have eight more things to do, take a break and come back later when you can refocus. So I think that's you know, it's how I would tell an athlete to think about their session. As soon as you feel like you're past the point where you can stay focused on the task at hand, take a break, go to work, go to school, whatever you have to do, and then come back later so you can remain focused because doing work just to do work is a waste of time. I do see the the second question there, just explaining the, the misfit sets. <clears throat> so um, this is a like years and years and years and years of writing accessory work or skill work for people and trying to find the best way to um, maybe guess where they're at on any given day is essentially impossible, especially um, when you're programming for, for thousands of people. Um, for anybody that's listening that doesn't know what I'm talking about, basically you have uh, a skill or an accessory that you do five sets of. Four of those sets are like seven days a week, no matter what, I will hit this 
set, you know, this many reps. So an example would be misfit sets, handstand pushups. I know that if I did five sets of handstand pushups with three minutes rest, that I could do sets of 20, no matter what. It's not like a small amount, but it would never be failure. So that's what we do for four sets. And then the fifth set is a max set. Now, what the fifth set does is it basically like the four sets are appropriate always, no matter what. The fifth set is appropriate for that day. It allows you to personalize because sometimes, you know, as people are realizing right now, when you're going through a bench press and strict press cycle, when you're also supposed to be doing handstand pushups, you know, am I getting my ass handed to me? Am I not doing enough prehab, rehab or warm up to get my shoulders ready? Um, so it's, it basically meets you where you're at for that fifth set and makes it super appropriate. It also allows athletes to, to maybe improve their athlete IQ a little bit. Cause we do the smooth sets. We do the challenging sets. We do things of that nature. And we see that not quite executed the way that it should be, um, on discord. Whereas man, when, when, when I look at discord and I see four by 10, one by 15, for a, for a misfit set, like it's over and over and over. People are, people do a really good job with this. So, um, it comes from a decade of remote coaching and, you know, a little bit of it stolen from the bodybuilding community. That's, that's one of the things that they do. They have their, you know, get your sets and reps in and then go to failure situation to, to really exhaust it. So. Yeah. I think of it as four sets for, for skill and, and quality development, one set for capacity exactly. sort of deal. Yep. Next, Christy twenty one fifteen nine. Oh, this is this is kismet that Sherb's getting this question. Sherb loves the twenty one fifteen nine. Working on I'm strength right and while my strength at percentages is improving, can do more reps at percentages. Top end one rep max is not moving much, if at all. This is across multiple lifts. I also don't need to add any body mass, so this isn't the issue. Help exclamation point. It's a great question for you too. Boom. What does that Roast, mean? Roasted. I don't know what you're saying. Suck me, buddy. Uh, <laughs> 2159. Or maybe it's a good question for me. This, <laughs> this and you guys that you guys are in the room. This won't right. be a popular answer, but be patient. To to me, this speaks to the fact that you are starting to clean things up because weights that used to be challenging for three reps are now easier for four and five reps. But typically when one rep max strength is not improving, there's a skill element involved. Yes, there is maybe raw strength. Maybe you need to get your deadlift and squat up. For more often than not, if we're talking percentages, I'm guessing you're probably leaning more towards the Olympic lifts, the things that we get tested in in our sport. It's probably a movement quality issue. So what's really nice about the website right now is that you guys went through, we all went through, especially Caroline, making sure that these things were buttoned up and nice, but created really thorough warmups for every single thing, which includes all of our lifting. And if you have not done the entire thing one time in its entirety, the way it's designed to be done, you will quickly realize it's exhausting to do it correctly. But that is important because it refines many different aspects of the lift. So what I would encourage you to do is start practicing that every single day and notice and tell me if you come back in six weeks and say, I don't feel like I'm getting better with the barbell because everyone I've watched go through that entire thing, begin to connect the dots between, oh, I understand that after I get the bar off the floor and I drive with my legs, I need to sweep the bar back into the hip. And this warm up forces you to do that. So I would lean towards more time spent with lighter or empty barbells and then more time spent warming your way up to your percentages and really making sure by the time you are starting your first like six by three of the squat cleans, for example, that feels perfectly buttoned up and every single rep feels good. It's not like, oh, I started to get my lather on set four of six. Cause I think too many people get too overwhelmed by what's on front in front of them for the day and just go like, you know, I just got to keep plugging away, plugging away, plugging away and don't pay attention to the quality of how they move. And then there's sort of just checking boxes instead of making improvements. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll go a little bit more sciency on, on this response, but the it's so there's, you've got your turtles and rabbits is what, what Drew likes to call them turtles, slow twitch athletes, I like turtles. athletes who <laughs> ath athletes so who hunting. who typically are more endurance oriented. They're more comfortable with the longer workouts. They can lift a higher percentage of their one rep max for more reps than let's say an average person. Your rabbits or your fast twitch folks, the guys who make their three rep max look really, really easy, and you wonder why they can't they fail on their fourth rep it's like 
what the fuck just happened? That's your fast twitch athlete, the guy who, again, hammers the assault bike, 20 cals in 18 seconds, but is a... Uh, 12 is all, seconds. Is all that's sorts fine. of 12 seconds. That's fine. But, <laughs> One second. Uh, but is in some deep trouble afterward for a long period of time. <clears throat> On average, I, I'm, I'll need a fact checker. Someone listening can fact check. No but Twitter's typically, listening. typically women are on the end of being more neuromuscularly efficient, which means they can perform more reps at a higher percentage of their one rep max relative to their male, Fact male counterparts. Fact checked. Beautiful. Okay. Um, one way, and I'm going to assume that I'm going to make the assumption that you're moving well enough that this is a strength thing. I will occasionally recommend to affiliate athletes who fall into the category of very slow twitch athlete to increase the percentages slightly. Rec the the recommended percentages um, under like ev I think everybody who's followed has had a day where it's like these percentages written are not going well. I'm gonna back them off five ten percent so that I can successfully complete the session. In some again some not all instances <clears throat> we might go in the other direction because a set of three at eighty percent doesn't necessarily do the same thing to an in to somebody who's very neuromuscularly efficient as it does to somebody who's not so in order for that athlete to gain the adaptation it either will uh, the book quote unquote will either tell you hey it's it's more reps at the same percentage or a slightly higher percentage for the same number of reps um, that's, uh, uh, man, I, you guys, you guys can tell me I'm, I'm off base on that, but I think that, I think that's a, you have to be very careful with doing that, making sure you're not overextending yourself and kind of tracking the cumulative fatigue that occurs when it comes to that sort of thing. Um, but I think that's, the, it's not an uncommon thing. Um, but also keep in mind that one rep maxes are, are an incredibly small percentage of the sport. And the fact that you are moving higher percentages of your one rep max is, is pretty good. Like it's more that's, useful. That's, that's way more useful within the sport of fitness. There would be three scenarios where I would get a lifetime PR. Number one, if I'm within striking weeks. distance of Sherb. <laughs> on the the first yeah. one. <laughs> Number <laughs> two, the first one. If Sabotage by the Beastie Boys is playing. <laughs> and number three, the only actual answer to this question is when I need to. There's a reason why we are not retesting one rep maxes after working on them. We have just, just beaten you to death with high CNS work for an entire phase. And right at the end of that, asking you to use that is not the right time. Perform your best now. So you'll notice that in every retest week this year, you have what is seems like, but is not a random one rep max built into a CrossFit style situation where you would do like the interval retest and then you have five minutes to find your one rep max. Um, even then, that scenario is still <clears throat> not super high stakes. So you could be the type of athlete where it's like, I just want to make sure that I can hit this because that will be manageable or that will be good enough for, for where I want to be within the open quarterfinals, whatever it is, or someone else is there and there is a reason to do it. But like Hunter said, it's just not a huge part of our sport. Um, and you know, you guys both had the correct answers to this. There are quite a few answers. If I was working with a CrossFit games athlete that truly needed to increase this, they would have a session that would have two lifts and three accessories every single day. So like there, there's a lot of different answers to this, but, um, I think people get way too wrapped around the axle with this idea of being able to hit a one rep max, a new personal best on a, you know, a random Tuesday. You've also got, so a little bit of nitpicking here, but it's like my, my one rep max not moving much, if at all, it's like, well, those are two different things. Like it hasn't moved in two years mm. it hasn't moved in three months like those are very different questions i don't know how long you've been training but <clears throat> the longer you've been training the right obviously the less frequently those numbers especially one rep maxes are going to move so um put that into context with whatever timeline you're thinking about it's like if my if you're if you're telling me your one rep max hasn't improved in a year and you've been working out for 10 like like i ain't worried not a big deal 
All right, Blue Spartan, very similar question, especially with cleans and snatches, basically not improving, even though the percentages and those reps are increasing. And then says Christy responds with all the You don't need work. to read every in phase no, one. Okay. Or one Keep max reading. did not budge. So <laughs> one of the things that I'm gonna say here about one rep max is too, is there's a huge psychological component to them. And if you're someone who gets psyched out by lifting yeah. weights, one of the things that we've done at Mr. Jim Portland over the years is building with athletes who have that same problem. So we basically tell them to go take a lap and they can't see what we put on the bar and we put on random assortments of fives and tens and fifteens and twenty fives that you can't quickly add up very fast in your head and tell them to go over and do the same thing they did last time. And more often than not, this leads to a PR. So if you find yourself maybe in a situation where you can be psychologically like psyching yourself out, you might need a training partner to help you load the barbell in a way that you can't quickly add and tell you to just do the same thing you did last time with small jumps leading to a new PR. We also didn't retest. So the only way that you would know that your one rep max didn't budge is if you went off the reservation, you will get an opportunity <laughs> to pull that one rep max in a scenario that we think is better. The fo- yeah, the follow up Christy was said her one rep max didn't budge again. We so didn't test s- it. One one we didn't one <laughs> we didn't re- one we didn't we didn't retest it. So it definitely didn't. Uh, two, it was a six week phase. So again, timeline here is important. Like you mean what do you mean? I didn't pr. I don't pr every time we do a six week lifting cycle. That let's let's be a little bit patient here. As far as the original question saying same boat, especially with cleans and snatches, that's where I will I will add what Sherb said to the other stuff, which is odds are, especially with a clean and a snatch, is a technical issue. So the things like the barbell therapy, maybe maybe it is a weakness template for either of those two movements, but I would I would be willing to bet that if I saw a video of movement, there's at least a couple technical errors that are preventing a, a one rep max cleaner snatch from going up. Yeah, when you when you sort of delineate those two, when you say like my one rep maxes aren't going up, but only in the Olympic lifting, like it's a technique thing. Yeah. That's all day. And that and and don't feel bad about this stuff. That is at the absolute highest levels. You can get someone to start back squatting more and start pulling more in their deadlift and you know we're we're fixing, you know, shoulder instability whatever it is. I mean, you have to be a like true student of the game technician with that barbell and the clean and the snatch to make huge improvements. But that's not what's bad about it. That's what's amazing about it. You can outwork the you know sort of not being as good at something like like you can look at it and say well if my technique is you know 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent better which is hard to measure but than my opponent then that means that i can even though they have this fast twitch that i'm talking about or whatever i can actually use it and and go and get that so if you're struggling with the clean and the snatch we have so many resources on our youtube channel and just become obsessed with the way that you move and it'll go up no matter what. Uh, Matt Milkey asks, when is the time to switch from hatchet to masters? Um, when you're 35, (laughs) (laughs) I think, I think what's good about the early stages of being a masters athlete is that you can appropriately choose which one is better for you just in terms of like like uh community aspect like if you've been had those virtual training partners that can always that can be really useful in the hatchet community you can stay there um the thing that i will say though is if you are following a specific season schedule and you really care about how you do in the age group quarterfinals, which aren't on the same weekend and probably don't have the, you know, sort of same, um, same exact focus as, as we would have programming wise, that once you really get wrapped into the masters community in that season, you'll want to follow the masters. And this would be the same for teens. You'll want to follow those programs because the way that we program for them is different. And you'll, you'll notice the differences that will take you into the right timeline. And it might be subtle day to day, but if you zoomed out into a macro view, you would see that we are trying to help you on a specific season schedule. So, um, it is a little bit personalized, but it doesn't have to be, you know, like Hunter joked, you snap your fingers and you move from one to the other. But as you get more into that community and care about that season, that's the time to make the switch. In my opinion. Next. Gigi Lama 
Uh, how do you improve efficiency on the assault runner? I've noticed a major difference in speed as well as fatigue when I run on them as opposed to running on the road. Sure, just so happens to be dabbling in the assault runner quite often right now. So another first who gives a fuck what the assault runner says for your <laughs> mile versus outside versus inside. That's the first thing I would tell someone is that they did their best to calibrate those to your outdoor times. But like, if you're like, man, I can run a six minute mile outside and I go into the runner and it says I'm running a nine minute mile. And there are two list. and there are two runners. Yes, it depends the, on which runner you the have. Newer yeah. ones seem to be closer to the outside normal speeds and the older ones seem to be a little bit slower. So <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. 20%. Talking, <laughs> at least 20%. Yeah. So the, the first thing I'd say is don't get too wrapped up in that. Second of all, What's really nice about a runner is that if you want to, you can set up a camera from profile and watch your form running, which is very difficult to do if you are outside on the road. Like it'd be really weird to be like running back and forth, like a hundred meter shuttle run, trying to go at your aerobic pace. Maybe if you're getting better at this and seeing yourself being a snapshot for two seconds, whereas in the runner, you can set up a Fuck, camera and watch. Remember we did that? Yeah, we did that. that but sucked. you can watch yourself run. Um, and then just know that because you are trying to pull a track to move the belt so you can run on it, you're going to work a little bit different muscle groups, probably a little bit more hamstring recruitment than you would on the outside. But more often than not, it probably is more akin to someone who's an overstrider and someone who is taking these big galloping steps and again, are working against themselves instead of letting gravity kind of propel them forward. So my recommendation would be to film yourself from the side get yourself a perspective on like what you look like when you're running. Are you too upright? Are you taking big strides? See if you can kind of dial those things in. And then second of all, it's just about putting your time in. Like anything else, any other machine, any other piece of equipment that we have here or movement, the more you do it, the easier it will get. And you know, while a math session on a runner is not the most enthralling thing in the whole world, you might want to fall asleep while you're doing it. It's one way to kind of inoculate yourself against how you feel on it and kind of put those reps in so that it doesn't eventually cause you know, it doesn't tax you the same way it does right now. So film yourself moving and then put your time in with your math sessions and maybe some of your shorter, you know, build pieces as well. And eventually this will catch up and actually make you a better runner outside, in my opinion. I think it's different enough that you have to treat it almost as a separate machine as far as familiarization with things like the pace on the monitor, the wattage, whatever metric you use for your your effort level and uh, based on the duration that you're actually running. But the other thing is, is the application of the air runner, like big picture, is almost exclusively limited to semifinals or or in-person competitions where one, you don't even know, we, we had this, that was kind of funny, Kelly spent a lot of time getting better on the air runner and running in general before last season, and it was an assault runner, and Mac has a true form. And right. it's like, I don't know what these fucking numbers mean. We were trying, <laughs> I was trying to figure it out, we figured it out as best we could in the back, but it was like, we you have to know like what what certain paces feel like, what kind of effort levels are, you know, towing the line versus you know, crossing that line of I'm going too fast sort of thing. So um, I think it's equal parts familiar, like time, time on the machine itself and just familiarizing yourself with the, the numbers on the screen more so than trying to compare your mile road time to your mile air runner time. Yeah. I mean, really quick, if this is the situation that it might be where you're just not multiplying the distances or time domain or this, this as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it says run 400 meters on the blog, then we tell people internally, if it's the old air runner to run 320 meters somewhere in that range. Um, so that's one thing. The other part of this, that's, that's cool. That maybe is a little bit counterintuitive to what you guys said is curved treadmills. Um, put a magnifying glass on your form yep. when you're when you're running. So uh, the way to tell if you're not running properly on one of those is fluctuations, consistent fluctuations in your wattage. So if you're looking at your pace and it just, you know, goes way up and then way down and then way up. Um, and then what's happening physically, if you if you're not as comfortable with looking at that, is your body's doing the same thing. Your feet are maybe in line with where the posts come down and then they're in front of it and then they're in back and you really feel like you're leaning in a certain direction. Um, and you know, like Sherb said, that overstride where you get a lot of like slow twitch athletes that reach their leg way back when they're running, um, that makes you want to fall on your face on an air runner. It's not good. Um, we're looking for more of more steps and more of like a circular motion to what's happening with your foot the whole time. So like Sherb said, go ahead and, and film it. Um, but it is one of those things where if you have bad running form, it's going to be 
really bad on the on the runner. You're the good news it. though is that if you pay attention to that on the runner, you can translate that yeah, to the sure. road, which is way more applicable. Learning how to pull pull on the chain with your with your hamstrings, which again, if you're feeling soreness in places, you're not usually sore after a runner versus the road. It's like okay, something there's there's some disconnect somewhere. Yep. All right, Amanda A underscore. I think it's Amanda. Amanda. I know and that in order to be better at the sport, you need to do the sport. In some cases, can it be better to work it on... It doesn't say can it be better. What? But can it? In some can cases... Can you? Be, can, can you do the can, can? God damn it. Basically, does it pay every once in a while to maybe skip some Metcons to isolate things like strength work, aerobic capacity, and skills at the expense of skipping Metcons for a while? Is that a smart plan? You, what? Can I can I read the whole question? Because I feel like yeah. did you talk about the beginner thing at all? Because she no. alluded to the beginner. I know that in order to become better at the sport, you need to do the sport. But can it, in some cases, be better? In this case, for a beginner who can't do much of the skills and also isn't strong at all, to work on strength, aerobic capacity, and skills on its own and skip the metcons for a while. Sorry, I wanted to. Well, I, sorry. I mean, there were a couple nuances that I think were. Valid. Someday I'll Here, let her now read. you can answer the question. I asked it to you. No, nope. no, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> when someone's brand new, I do think it does pay to be able to do some of these things separately. So you're careful. Not, so you're not getting too far. <laughs> Dukes are up. <laughs> not too far in the weeds and never doing a Metcon because sure. again, yeah, yeah. the sport is being able to do conditioning in couplets and triplets and things like that. But does that mean you can't spend one session of your day focusing on strength and accessory to get strong in the morning or maybe your morning sessions aerobic work because you realize you can't you know, keep breathing and moving throughout workouts and then later on you come back and you do a little bit more sport specific stuff. Um, I'm of the opinion you don't mix skills into workouts. You know, the very rarely does it make sense to have a skill that you don't have yet be in a workout where you're trying to figure it out on the fly. Now, there are some opportunities like Let's say, for example, it was AMRAP three minutes and you had to do like a long row and you had a short amount of time to play around the pegboard and you've never been on a pegboard before, but you have good strict pull-ups, you can do legless rope climbs. Maybe then you see what you can do under fatigue. But if you're getting stopped over and over again in workouts because you're trying to do a skill or something that's outside the capacity that you currently have, it does not make sense to put that in there. Put those things in their own separate sessions where you can work on skills, but continue to develop your cardiovascular fitness and your strength while working on these skills outside of that and then keep Metcons for more of like, can I create adaptation for myself? Can I go in there and work on muscular overload maybe at a lighter weight or fewer reps so I continue to practice? But I don't ever want to completely get away from Metcons because that is, again, our sport. Like you talked about earlier on, great if you're really strong, but if you can't move, how good are your one rep maxes? Uh, you need to do CrossFit. And you need to make sure that when you are doing the Metcons that have skill elements in them, you are either substituting the movement completely with something that is comparable. Uh, and I, I don't even think for someone who's a beginner, the stimulus is is like the be all end all. Substitute it with a similar movement pattern uh, that enables you to increase your fitness. Practice your gymnastics skills outside of conditioning pieces if you're saying that you don't have any of the skills then i would also be curious to know what your capacity with things like push-ups strict dips strict pull-ups are because if you're lacking in the the body weight strength category you're you're going to be jumping the gun by trying to develop skills that enable like a kipping pull-up that allows you to use your hips when you're not necessarily ready for it as a beginner um but i think that i think you need to still continue to do to do crossfit um and then when you are focusing on the olympic lifts sp specifically it has to be a huge technique focus the benefit to being a beginner and asking questions like this is that you don't have years of poor movement patterns that athletes develop because they weren't taught correctly they didn't have a coach paying attention to them or whatever if you're new you have a golden opportunity to own to learn how to do everything right the first time and your life will be infinitely easier as you develop farther in the sport. But um, don't skip the Metcons, but do substitute movements that are going to crush your intensity. Yeah, I, Amanda, I think you are so close to the right answer, but also nowhere near the right answer. <laughs> um, and, and everyone has gone through this. 
in theory, this should work. And it doesn't. Everyone, including us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone goes through this moment of, well, if I just need to get better at gymnastics, monostructural and lifting, and then, you know, every once in a while, they ask me to put it back together. Um, it just doesn't work. But what's amazing is these ideas are not mutually exclusive. You can do what you asked and what we are asking at the exact same time. You need to have just as many eggs in the basket of low skill Metcons, traditional couplets, triplets, CrossFit, and monostructural work, skill work, and strength work. That's what a CrossFit program is. That is what our program is. Um, so you do need to take those things out and you do need to do them on their own, but not sacrificing CrossFit because the adaptation and the stimulus and the things that you learn are just too damn important. So, so close, just do both. Am I asking this again? Yeah, you're good Eric, at asking questions. Go ahead. <laughs> Easy guy. You can be <laughs> fucking salty. <laughs> Eric with a K, how often should we compete? Question mark. Um, it, Eric, I think I can answer this question for you a little bit, but answering this question in a general sense is very challenging. Um, if someone is trying to come in a certain band of placements at the CrossFit Games, <clears throat> we'll use that as one end of the spectrum. They should compete like once or twice in the off season. Pretty, pretty simple. But if you go down to the majority of the CrossFit community that would be listening to this podcast, the people who are interested in quarterfinals and reaching for semifinals, you know, maybe go to semifinals a few times, um, whatever it is, it's all about preference for you. It's all about what matters more. If the CrossFit's, if CrossFit HQ season matters more to you, we might up that number to two or three. Um, and if it doesn't and you want to compete once a quarter, I think that's okay. I would probably max it out somewhere in that range and you have to decide whether once a quarter does include the CrossFit stuff or maybe you don't care about their season and have more fun going to local throwdowns or a Wadapalooza or whatever it is. Um, I think if you got more, I mean, you, you guys can jump in, but more than once a quarter, I don't know that you're training would ever really make those sort of connections to get better. Yeah, you have to ask yourself like why you want to compete. Is it because you enjoy the competitive element of being against other people like on game day and racing against somebody? Is that the reason why you're doing it? Is it to gain experience so that if you do qualify for a semifinal, you know what it's like to compete on that day and you're ready to do that because you've practiced the habits of, you know, leading up the primer week, like leading up to like what that competition looks like, what the day of looks like, how do you fuel, how do you recover? If you're looking to like collect data, then yeah, maybe once a quarter is a good way to do it. Um, the only thing I would tell somebody, and this is something that you and I have actually talked about today, <laughs> is that if you're constantly competing, you're taking time away from your training because every time you compete, yes, you are getting experience and that does help you maybe long-term, but think about how many days you have to adjust to allow yourself to compete and those are opportunities you potentially miss for training that might be a better use of your time if you have different goals. Like the example here would be, hey, I wanna compete at semifinals, but I also wanna do the Wadapalooza qualifier, Madrid, Zelos games, and you list off 18 different things. It's like, well, if every third week you're doing qualifiers and whatnot, how much training are you missing because you're doing these things over and over again? So basically ask yourself, what are your objectives and why you want to compete? And just make sure that those are in line with your, whatever your highest priority competition or highest priority is with training and just make sure those two things are in alignment. I think it's helpful that in, and this is also <laughs> beneficial from someone, let's say you are somebody who's going to wants to compete more frequently to gain that experience. Part of gaining that experience is you compete, you take a little bit of time off, you get back into training, you ramp up, you execute the competition. It's not how often should I go do a th a partner competition on a Saturday, right? It's like we're when we're answering this question, we're trying to think about the athlete who's like, hey, I'm going to do this competition. I've got it circled on my calendar. I am going to train for this competition and potentially even apply like some sort of peaking and tapering schedule. But if it's and and that is information in itself and that like doing going through that entire process really kind of limits you from a calendar perspective to, you know, probably like you said, once every three or four months at most. But right. uh, 
picking kind of what your objective is, which what is the most important competition and understanding that you have to have you have to have a priority of what's most important. And if the other things, the other competitions are going to detract from the more important thing, then you've got to got to reallocate priorities. Right. Ryan McKay. When do we get to stop skiing? Never. <laughs> We're certainly not going to stop skiing, um, but I think there's more to this question. <laughs> when should people decide on when to dial back on body weight slash monostructural and focus energy elsewhere? Um, for people listening, to give more context to the question before Sherb answers, um, Ryan is absurdly good at monostructural and body weight movement. So good. Yeah. So I, I just just to throw out there, like like didn't he also have a third ACL yes. tear? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you can't use your leg. You can't like, can't safely use your legs. So coach is making me ski. Sounds like a good coach. <laughs> uh, honestly, it all goes back to your goals. Like, what are you prioritizing? What are you training for? And then realize that, like, if you have a major gap in your strength, and you decide to do a bunch of metcons and body or a bunch of body weight workouts and monostructural things at the expense of never being able to get improve your strength, then your priorities aren't in alignment. I would never tell you to stop doing model structural work. I would go for just about every single athlete on earth. There are very rare cases where it might be appropriate. Like someone who's trying to get really strong, like Luca, for example, like I know he does plenty of model structural work still, but five days, uh, seven days a week. Sorry. Yeah. But, but still <laughs> has those sessions sure. we talked about earlier where yes. he goes in, does two lifts, three accessories, then he takes a break, refuels and comes back later in the day. So right. there are athletes that it does apply to, but for the most part, you should never skip your bitch work and if you find yourself with a major gap, ask yourself, are these body weight workouts and monostructural pieces closing the gap on what I want to improve on or are they not? And if they're not, and again, the allocation of eggs and baskets needs to be adjusted so that you spend more time maybe getting stronger or moving a barbell to build your confidence and your skill level so that those things catch up to the things you're really good at. I hate to nitpick again, but if dial back on body weight and monostructural, so that leaves weightlifting and throwing <laughs> maybe, cross, cross, maybe, like maybe some, crossfit some yeah. crossfit right right crossfit workouts that don't involve just body weight I'd, right I'd, i'm also not 100 percent aware of which lifts he's allowed to do right now versus not sure yeah. yeah so let's assume that you didn't just have acl reconstructive surgery or whatever what whatever it was um I, I don't know if there is an instance where you need to dial back on I don't know, like 80% of the sport. So no. Um, I, I know that, I know that one of his goals is to get stronger, but I feel like that might be on hold a little bit right now. Um, and Ryan, you can correct us if we're wrong mm -hmm. in, in discord, but, uh, there's an issue, um, with pacing or mindset. If you are good at monostructural body weight and not good at CrossFit, like if, if you feel like why am I over here in this regard, but then over here in that regard? Um, and athlete IQ and pacing and all the stuff that we that we dig really deep into at training camp um, is is really important. And you know, like one of the things that that is really important that I'm going to be working with Sherb on this year is just this idea of if you have confidence over here and it has a direct correlation to this thing that you don't have confidence in, then we need to go find that confidence. It might not be pacing and it might not be this. It's, well, metabolic, there's a metabolic machine here that isn't then translating to this other specific thing, which I think a lot of times is mindset. So um, pacing and mindset, I would say, matter more in this situation than maybe, maybe you're aware of. All right, Gus, let's talk about eggs and baskets. In my age group, raw strength is near the top end, but literally everything else needs major improvement. Gymnastics, engine, and technical lifts need work. While personalizing the program, how far is too far? For example, is it acceptable to skip the strength focus pieces for extended periods of time in order to prioritize other baskets? How'd I read that one? <sighs> <laughs> did, did, did our, Perfect. That's yeah, what I wanted. Kind of, you didn't say his last name. We blended like seven or eight words together, but that's how you speak in my um, world. <laughs> so to, to directly answer the question, when personalizing the program, how far is too far? I'm assuming you mean as far as deleting lifting work and prioritizing the conditioning work. Um, it, it, the good news is that you press a button, and for like two days, you don't do lifting work. It's not going to matter. 
You do that for three, four weeks, it's not going to matter much. You do that for an entire phase, see how it goes. It's a, it's an iterative process that you have to determine to, to kind of figure out for yourself. Again, the one rep max is the top end strength is an incredibly small portion of the sport. If, and we see it all the time when athletes do take time off from lifting because they're they are somebody who's at the top end of that maybe the lifting they just need to take a little bit of a break their cns is beat up athletes don't lose crossfit athletes don't lose a ton of strength just because you weren't doing five by five every you know once a day or, or a couple times a week so um i don't i think as far as how far is too far it I don't have a line for you. I don't have the line in the sand. I would still make sure that you are um, doing things like your barbell therapy and technique work for the Olympic lifts. There's almost no CrossFitters on the planet who couldn't use improvements in technique and they're they're clean in their snatch, their Olympic lifts. Um, the other question and the other the other point to this for the the masses is if you are somebody who is feels like they're on the top end of their strength, I would ask what. Um, are you, are you heavy? Like, are you, do you, are you in the white, right weight range for your height and compared to your, to your, you know, conditioning scores and whatnot? So, I mean, um, it's where your mind goes if someone's trying to get stronger or if they're exactly, like, yeah. Yep. Both same, scenarios. same conversation we have, I have with an affiliate athlete, kind of the, the other 23 hours of the day question, are you doing the things, uh, that you need to, in order to recover from those sessions? But Again, like, are you, if you're on the very, very upper end of the strength spectrum, how, like, can you afford to take 10% off those numbers? And if that means taking some, some body mass off or something like that, how much will that benefit your conditioning? And I'd be willing to bet the, the, the slight reduction in strength for the proportionally larger increase in conditioning would be well worth it. Something that I've done in a remote coaching setting before, and this is somewhat specific, is I have deleted every single lift that is not present in our sport. So go through in your back squats and your strict press and your bench press. That stuff just poof, it's gone. And then your front squat, Olympic lifting, things of that nature. I will knock five to 10% off of the percentage work. Um, if you're like crazy strong, it would be 10%. Um, if you're somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, it would be five. And then that leaves you with two or three days a week where you are still lifting, but it's a little bit more technique focused. You make sure that you're still doing it. And then the whole eggs and baskets thing, you can look at it from the standpoint of, yes, I did do that. But from a, like a CNS standpoint, it probably didn't take very much out of me and it becomes more of a deliberate practice thing. And then, you know, hopefully you have the free time for it. That's the one thing that I forget sometimes with the type of athletes that I coach is like, you can then know that you're, you know, you have more energy for your bitch work and your intervals and, and all that stuff. So, um, that would be a bit more of a specific scenario and something that I've done for multiple athletes in the past. We got out of order here, so I'll pick it back up. Melinda L M asks, or did I? Oh, you're, you're right. Yeah, this, okay. this is your question. Uh, what are some things to focus on for us tall, long limbed folks? Parentheses. I'm a master's 55 plus to work, to work towards those gymnastics move like handstand walks and handstand pushups. Um, it's actually, I believe a misnomer that, uh, length in this case is a bad thing. We, we actually find that a lot of taller athletes do better in their pressing, um, because it's easier with longer limbs to have better range of motion and access to that strength. Um, but what that means is, is we are looking at it from the standpoint of we need mobility and stability first. Um, and, plenty of resources on making sure that your shoulder mobility is there. And then that prerequisite of being very comfortable with being upside down. Um, there's multiple ways to do this. You literally just kick up into a handstand hold. Um, we've got some, uh, creative and not so nice things coming up in the programming later on where you do a wall walk into a handstand hold and then you come down and you do two wall walks into a longer handstand hold and so on. There's 
So just to say that there's the nose and toes that, version. There's the. He, I love. Me he's my. Te- he's my accessory tester. He knows all of this shit before it ever happens on the blog. Um, but mobility and stability would be where I would head. That that would be the the direction that I would head for somebody because again, um, the idea of that shorter range of motion being better. We see so many shorter athletes with poor shoulder mobility that when it really comes down to it in a Metcon where maybe, you know, you got a deadlift and you got to do these other things, you start to get into some bad shapes. The smaller athletes don't do well because again, they don't have that access and even the handstand push up longer limb, you know, you can get a real nice momentum, a nice kick with having longer legs. So I just want to put it out there that it's not only not a death sentence in this scenario for, for a taller athlete, it can actually be better because you have access to your strength as opposed to, it would be nice if I could, if I could do this, but I can't. Yeah, I hear I hear masters athlete and I instantly think mobility and stability, like you said, Drew. So I don't have too much to add there. Just make sure you can get in the positions you need to get to and spend time upside down. If you do both of those things and you mix in a bunch of pressing, which we do already on the website, like your setup, best case scenario. And if you find that you're still having trouble, that's like one of those situations where you may go into Discord and say, Hey, can anyone give me advice on this? And then we, you know, chime in on that. So yeah. that'd be the only thing I add to it. Only other thing I'll add is aside from the mobility thing, I'll third that heavily i've almost never met somebody who says i'm not very good at inverted movement and then they can put their hands directly over their head in a perfect position so improving your mobility and then um especially the pressing moves pressing maneuvers like you have to have that baseline strength of push up deficit push up dips those sorts of things like you can only kipping's only going to get you so far so if you don't have that requisite upper body kind of strict strength that'd be a good place to start as well Who's supposed to read this next question? You are. You've been you've been off for like two weeks. Uh, on this podcast. <laughs> hey oh, guys, where the fuck is the engine uh, class for Team Misfit? Is it gonna uh, are people that subscribe to our affiliate programming going to get an engine class? It is not in like on the immediate calendar. Uh, I, I don't have a better answer for you than that. Um, I think you might. I get to answer this question. <laughs> In any scenario, uh, yes, it is in the works because you guys just did a podcast teasing it, um, and then a customer just asked for it. Uh, so yes, it is in the works. <laughs> Boom, answered. I would I would say for for you know like really making sure that it's dialed in and that it has the right application and coaches notes. You might be looking at a you know a full phase plus away, um, but we will add specialty classes at no increase to your membership if you are a Team Misfit affiliate. Should have deleted that one, Hunter. Should have. I thought he might. <laughs> All right, you're up, sure. All right, Jay Bateman. Jason Bateman. Jason Bateman. Let's get to return some videotapes. Uh, should I ever prioritize accessory over lift and Metcon if I only have 60 to 90 minutes? Uh, if you're biasing your strength, maybe. If you're looking for general fitness, then no. Check. <laughs> Check. All right. You're up, coach. Uh, J.R. Davey 21 asks, what advice would you give to older athletes returning from injury? I'm old and I'm always injured, so this is a good question for me. Fastball down the middle. <laughs> down the middle. Um, the biggest advice that I can give in this scenario is that you still have a choice in your fitness and your strength and your skill. Um, one of the things that we talk about internally when we're struggling with, should this movement be on this day? Is this too much pressing too much hanging from the pull-up bar is that we don't need to get super obsessed with the movement because we are chasing a stimulus. So we go in we know that we want a workout to be a certain duration and we're looking for a certain stimulus and we have so many tools to get that done. So when you're coming back from an, in, from an injury, knowing the things that you really shouldn't be doing and just not doing them, literally not doing them at all or doing the, you know, strict version of them and accessory is fine. But if you are coming back from injury and skipping things altogether, um, that's an excuse that you've decided on your own. It's your subconscious coming in and sort of letting you off the hook. There is a way in every scenario to come in and fucking get after it and move the needle and get closer to your goal. If you are injured, 
And I've been through the fucking psychological warfare that it is to have injuries stack on top of one another. And at the end of the day, it is an excuse. It's something that you are putting in your own way. There is a way to achieve a myriad of stimulus in almost every single scenario. So don't get discouraged. Keep working. Just get rid of the stuff that that you shouldn't be doing. Go hard on the stuff that you can do and you will get through it for sure question andrew mcfarland with no vowels other than the a ask them. sherb why are high school needed to change the locks on the weight room doors so the hours of the weight room weren't conducive to my schedule so i would break <laughs> <Man>. in <laughs> to the Wyndham high school weight room to work out and the cops would show up and I would run away and then they would leave and I'd break back incredible. in and keep working out. So <laughs> the, at Wyndham High School, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, the weight room used to be on the outside of the building where you had to, you could access it from the outside. So I the figured out room that was on the used, outside of the building. No, no, no. Like the door, the door to access the weight room was on the outside of the building instead of like in the middle of the, the actual building itself where I couldn't get to it. So I'm what cracking. I would do Sounds is like I would take either a credit card <laughs> or a screwdriver or whatever and pop the lock and then go work out. But it's got a silent alarm. So fuck, a couple minutes later, blue lights would show up. <laughs> you get a two-minute workout. <laughs> and do Fran every time. <laughs> 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 I don't come back. Or I would find a, and I, eventually they moved it to a different space in the gym I w or in the high school. And I would find a way into the high school and then break into those double doors. So quite a few times I was booted for exercising outside of exercise hours. Follow up questions. What were the posted hours of the weight room and what time did you use the weight room? Oh, they're like they're open, like very small hours. Like our, the high school weight room was open from like 5 30 AM to 7 AM Monday through Friday. And that was it. So basically gotcha. anytime outside those times, I would break into it if I wanted to work out. Got so it. I would. Big guy needed to sleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so yeah, now there's different locks in the doors. <laughs> Fuck. That's All a pretty right. good story. <laughs> Mr. Rainey, will you guys ever make an SSE banner to sell? Hunter, you know the answer to this question. <laughs> Tell us. Sure do. Drew's on it. He'll have it next week. <laughs> <laughs> Be at your door tomorrow. The funny thing is this has actually been asked in a DM by somebody else recently. So there are misfit flags. There are STA flags. People want to suffer one. We'll make it happen. Check. Brian Hamilton, best way to build toe to bar, chest to bar, bar muscle up capacity. There's a few answers to this question. The very first answer is um, that magnifying glass again on your technique. So if you are struggling with the butterfly or you're struggling with, um, you know, maybe you're piking your toes to bar, or you're scooping them, whatever, um, make sure that head to our YouTube channel and sort of line up the videos of your movements with what we're teaching just in terms of like a really intimate knowledge of the shapes that you're creating and trying to recreate those. Um, so that would be step number one, really important to do that. And we actually have skill progressions for videos as well. So if you've identified that, nope, I'm not doing what they're looking for there. We have skill progressions for the butterfly. We have skill progressions for the toe to bar. Uh, for the bar muscle ups. We have all of that stuff on there. Now, once we get into, I'm moving well, but I'm new at this, or I don't have the capacity. Um, I typically rotate through three separate things with my remote athletes. Um, go to right off the bat is climbing the ladder. So you would have a session where you would do one toe to bar, shake it out, two toes to bar, shake it out, three toes to bar. You go up that ladder. And if you know, you're not going to get your next set and have it be smooth, you rest for three to five minutes and you repeat that two times. Um, depending on your skill level, you can go up by twos, you can go up by threes, just really depends on the movement and your capacity. The second thing that I do is misfit sets. So you would go in and have your, you know, you probably know what that is if you follow the blog, but it's what we talked about earlier in the podcast with the four even sets and the one max set. And then because I think stimulus needs to be rotated, the six rounds of one smooth set rest two minutes. Um, and keep those babies on repeat and I'll, I'll put an athlete through it for a phase and then I'll just shift so that they get a, you know, sort of a different feel for, for the movement and, and different rep ranges. But, um, those movements, I would say all three of them would be like, uh, I probably have athletes work on them twice a week. 
Yeah, once like during the three-day block and once during the two-day block, if that makes sense. Yep. And I, I can speak to the fact that climb the ladder works really well. I was someone that did not like chest to bar pull-ups and the one, two, three, four, five, whatever, then two, four, six, eight, ten, whatever, that progression, work leaps and bounds, but just crawl before you walk kind of what I'm saying here is don't jump ahead and think that like after two weeks of doing it, you're there. Like, I think I spent six months in the one, two, three, four, fives until that got good. Once that was really dialed in, then moved on to two, four, six, eight. So biggest thing here is be patient and don't try to put the cart before the horse. I don't have anything to add. That's good. Is that everything? Man, that was I think it. so. We're going to do final thoughts anyways. You can bring up a random topic. I, I think a I think a common a common theme to all a lot of these questions has has to do and it kind of it probably gets irritating to hear it again but the movement efficiency thing is is so 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 important I can't tell you the number of athletes we have who come to camp they're really interested in learning like fixing movement patterns whatever they do it they crush it at camp I see them at the next camp and it's like I see we only changed our movement patterns for two and a half days and we didn't continue that training kind of training that 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 improvement in movement mechanics delayed gratification is dope yeah <laughs> um and it's like and and i'm and it's groundhog's day it's like hey we've had this conversation i have the same conversation with affiliate athletes hey what's wrong with my snatch you can't put your arms straight over your head that's what's wrong with your snatch it's not like there's not there's no like okay i'm gonna change my answer to give you the answer that you want the mechanics thing Hunter always is, does that. I always do that. <laughs> the mechanics thing is is so important, and we've got just a ton of resources everywhere. YouTube channel, Misfit Athletics Instagram, the Team Misfit Instagram has a lot of movement efficiency tips, and that's the for the a lot a large portion the same uh, same stuff we would tell athletes wanting to compete individually. But um, if you're asking these questions specifically about the higher skill movements, snatch, clean, gymnastics, all that sort of stuff, the first step has to be making sure that you are doing the movement and practicing it in the correct, most efficient way possible. Asterisks within the sport of CrossFit. Final thoughts. I encourage you to keep using this channel. I think this was a very productive conversation. And I think that questions channel on discord could be used a lot more than it currently is like it's great to have one of these podcasts where you can all sit around and make jokes and talk about things that'll make some noticeable changes but don't wait for a Q&A podcast to ask questions like one of the reasons why discord exists other than sharing scores is so you can all help one another get better at the sport of CrossFit and become healthier happier and fitter human beings so I would encourage you all to continue to pour questions in there knowing that like just because we call for a podcast doesn't all of a sudden the only time you can have permission to ask questions. The more questions you ask, the more you nerd out on this stuff and the more you take ownership over your own personal athlete education, the fitter you're going to be. That's the other side of the coin when it comes to the physicality. Like you need to have physical traits to be good at our sport, but you also need to have the mentality that goes with it. And if you only focus on the X's and the X's and not the X's and O's, meaning you're only doing the, the training hot part, but you're not using the, you know, headspace and the mindset stuff and you have questions and you're not asking them because you're afraid that someone might be like oh, that's a stupid question don't do that ask the question come at us with it we want to help you there so i just want to plug the discord channel i think the questions thing was great this time but let's make that channel feel or that i don't know if that's to call the channel is it called the channel on discord yeah, yeah call use that channel more often and help one another because if you have the question guarantee somebody else does as well I think it was a, a really good episode from the standpoint of the questions that were being asked. And I think it makes sense that the type of people who gravitate towards our program are the ones who are in it and asking these questions. Um, literally the entire basis for Misfit Athletics beginning was this idea that there is no one size fits all. And we have to be able to figure out if we're going to send out programming to thousands of people, how do you serve everybody and their, and their needs um, and their weaknesses and all of that. So um, when you're going into the programming and you're looking at what you should be doing, um, I would say 70 to 80% of the athletes out there can just stick to what we say is mandatory and add zero to one pieces and really get a good thing. If you have these like glaring weaknesses and massive strength, I think that's when you're in the 20 to 30% on the other side and you need to personalize it further. Um, the, the, the danger here though, is in that overcorrection. And 
we overcorrect in this sport. We overcorrect as a society. We, o- we basically like the new thing is the thing we all gravitate towards. And it is our job as coaches to make sure that the programming um, has nuanced changes and not just, oh, this is the new thing. So we're only going to do that. You know, we're only doing the backwards facing handstand push ups now. It's the only thing that's on the blog. Show up six by 10 every day. You'll do great. And then it won't be programmed ever again. <laughs> um, so it's really important to have that. So I think so many of you asking questions are in the right headspace and the warning is not to overcorrect. We still need to be strong and we need to be good at CrossFit and we need to be skilled and all the stuff that's in there is really important. Um, the nuance of how you could get a little bit better in this area or that area um, hopefully was provided within this podcast, but keep asking really good questions, but do not overcorrect based on where you're at currently. We did it. Did we do it? Yep. All right, ladies and gents, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Misfit Podcast. And thank you to our show sponsors. You can head to misfitathletics.com and try the brand new website with the week in advance and the weakness templates and all of that stuff for two weeks for free. That free trial for two weeks still exists, even with all of the new changes at misfitathletics.com. You can head to properfuel.co. Use the code word MISFIT to save on hydration, on post-workout nutrition, on your pre-workout, all that good stuff. And you can head to sharpentheaxco.com. Use your favorite athlete's code for the fall collection, both Sharpen the Axe and Misfit Athletics. Lightweight hoodies, lightweight running joggers. See you next week.